Today we are reviewing a very mechanically complicated case. This is the Lian Li Langpool 3. It's $150 to $170, and it has a lot of mechanical gimmicks or features, depending on how you look at them, like cable covers right here. This one's actually, there we go. Uh, that one's magnetically secured. This one over here, and then the doors that open with a lever on the side instead of something like, say, a pull tab, which would be much cheaper, but also much less interesting. So we're going to be looking at this today, comparing it to other competing cases in the same $150 price class. We'll be looking at thermals, noise, and everything else in between for an objective analysis of the Lanquil 3. Before that, this video is brought to you by EVGA's X570 Dark motherboard. The EVGA X570 Dark is a high-end motherboard for AM4 CPUs, built around extreme overclocking and tested heavily by EVGA's Kingpin. The X570 Dark has a uniquely rotated socket and RAM layout, 90-degree rotated cables for ease of installation and management, and tons of troubleshooting features to make building, testing, and overclocking easier. Check out EVGA's X570 Dark high-end motherboard at the link in the description below. So for the case today, pricing is pretty simple in that it just goes up depending on whether it is RGB or non-RGB, and then there are white and black models as well. We have both of them here today that we're going to look at. For whatever reason, Lian Li has decided to solve one of our longest standing complaints with the Lanquil series. They go back, believe it or not, as far as a Lanquil 1. And it was officially called the Lanquil 1, so Lian Li was revealing its hand very early that it was going to make a lot of these. The Lanquil 1, the Lanquil uh, 2 led into a Lanquil 2 mesh, which was largely created after criticism from our review of the Lanquil 2 non-mesh, which sucked thermally, but was very interesting otherwise. And they made a lot of improvements with it. The mesh was actually a pretty good case. Uh, so the thing that they solved with this, we, we need to go get the Lanquil 2 mesh to demonstrate, it was one of the mechanical features of the case. So our case hallway has a Lanquil right here. Okay, we can go look at this. Our biggest complaint for this case, which was otherwise very good, was simply that getting into the main compartment where your computer is, where you're going to build the system, required uh, opening these bottom panels. Not a big deal. It's like one extra step. But it did seem a little bit superfluous. Uh, and that's, that's been solved now. So that's why this exists. And uh, now these can be opened independently of the others. Now, opening this does bring me to a couple points. So this is only a mesh case now. They've seated the fans very far back here, which is interesting because it increases the surface area that the fans can pull air through. When it's smashed right up against the mesh, normally you lose some of the performance. There's a little bit more of an effect from the impedance on the fans as they try to pull air in. Uh, you end up in a, basically a pressure situation as opposed to just more purely a flow situation. And on the side here, where they've gone with mesh on both of these sides, the one on uh, this side of the case is completely unobstructed. And the one on the other side of the case, you could remove all of these drive mounts if you wanted. But if you wanted all the extra drive mounts, it is not really mesh. It's kind of mesh in looks only, because uh, you do end up obstructing a lot of it. But you know, it's, it's also on a side where the airflow is not that critical, because the power supply is cooled from underneath anyway. As for the rest of the exterior, both of the main side panels are transparent glass with cables behind the motherboard tray almost entirely hidden from view by the two metal covers that you're seeing. This is similar to the Lancol 2's arrangement, but with one key difference. The covers in the Lancol 2 could be screwed down, while in the Lancol 3, they are only magnetic. Whether or not you like the covers is a matter of opinion. Uh, I actually don't mind them. Patrick doesn't like them. But they're almost mandatory here because the side panel is held on with magnets that will pop open if the cables push outwards. So that's why they're there. Making the covers magnetic as well makes them bad at their main purpose, which is holding cables in place, ideally with some force, and the force part doesn't apply here. Opening the cable covers then, cable management is pretty good thanks to the size of the case, although installing a full set of four three and a half inch drives would change that by filling up the power supply shroud. Lian Li has pre-installed several extra long Velcro straps, which we have mixed feelings on. The left side works well for keeping I.O. and R.G.B. cables tucked out of the way, but the length of the straps on the right side is unhelpful. The bar with cable cutouts at the edge of the motherboard can be adjusted back and forth. 
which we found actually necessary to get our video card installed. It'll depend on the card you have, though. Lee and Lee could have just designed this bar in a way that didn't need adjustment in the first place, though. Now, the main benefit of this bar, the one down here, moving is really just that it can support water cooling components like pumps and reservoirs, and you can move it around slightly to adjust for them, which would maybe get you out of some trouble if you mismanaged how you were planning to route your tubes and you needed maybe an extra half an inch of slack or something one way or the other. But otherwise, that's, that's really it. It's that and accommodating the GPU. But again, you kind of circumvent the accommodating the GPU problem if you just design the bar differently, but then you lose some of the cool water cooling support and features. For more mechanical stuff on the back side here, the two SSD sleds on the back of the motherboard tray are spring-loaded here. Uh, so you can mount either with just the spring or there's an optional thumb screw that goes in to secure the SSD, like if you're worried about it during transit or you're just nervous about uh, not securing it with anything else. Like that, for example, was, was suboptimal for securing things, being completely open at all times. Not great. But you, but you can use the thumb screw. Probably should. Now, these are the primary two and a half inch mounts, but there's a total of 12 mounting locations available, or eight if four three and a half inch drives are installed. The case ships with two hard drive cages under the power supply shroud, one of which can be removed to allow the other's position to be adjusted, and both cages can have an additional drive sled mounted on top. Both are included in the accessory kit that Lee and Lee ships with this. Lee and Lee is not selling hot swap back plates this time for the Lancol 3, and that was a feature that added maybe some value to the Lancol 2's lower side panel doors. As for water cooling support, the front radiator mount is removable and reversible as it is in earlier Lancol cases, but there's now a spring-loaded latch to hold the mount in place. Screws can optionally be used as well. The handle is directly under the front I.O., and we found it can get caught up in the wires which may be another reason to swap the I.O. to the bottom of the front panel. And that is something you can do. It's a supported feature to move the I.O. around, although if you move it to the bottom of the front panel, you might restrict your clearance if you have a longer USB key or something like that. The top radiator mount isn't toolless, but it is still removable. The quantity of mounting points make it extremely versatile, but it also means that there's only a 5cm strip of fully open space in the center of the mount. The case can mount 360mm radiators at the front and on top of the power supply shroud. Mounting fans or radiators here eliminates the use of the bottommost motherboard expansion slots and requires moving the shroud top to its forward position, reducing clearance for the front mount, although there's still enough ventilation on the lower side panels to make this a surprisingly viable option. We'll talk about that in the thermal section later. Lee and Lee claims that the top mount fits 420mm radiators, but installing one may make the top tray non-removable and may require downsizing or removing the rear exhaust fan. The Lancol 3 has excellent radiator support overall, but we would suggest a 360mm maximum. There are some other fit and finish issues than the usability things we've talked about. So this isn't the biggest deal in the world, but we did have one loose hinge on our review unit. You can fix this on your own because there's two screws back here. It's just a Phillips head driver to fix that loose hinge problem. It shouldn't ship that way. Uh, it's, uh, it's hard to dock too many points because it's fixable, but it's still sort of a attention to detail or QC oversight and on a review unit, which is never really a great sign. Now, for other stuff, the front panel is a little bit on the barbaric side for its removable. So first, to get it off, we have to open everything up. And once we've opened everything up, the method chosen for removing it is grab and yank. NZXT would be proud here. If, if we can get NZXT's tweet on the screen, just yank hard. Well, that was less bad than last time I did it. So that's removal of the front panel. It could be, I guess the thing, the thing we were getting at with this is it's not abnormal to remove a front panel that way. But with a case that is this advanced, with all the different levers, springs, and gadgets that it's added for all this extra flair, uh, it probably will be winning best mechanical design in our awards show this year. But even with all of that, they haven't done anything to advance the removal of the front panel. So it's not something we'd normally pay attention to, 
but it really sticks out on a case like this that's overhauled everything else mechanically and with how you interact with the case. And that brings us to the next fit and finish issue, which is that for this, so this is the reversible uh, fan tray, which is actually really useful, and it's something we've liked. It's been around for a while on cases, but this thing, it's, by the way, another spring-loaded part of the design is right here, and we'll get a shot of the inside of that as well. But when we remove it on one of our two cases, they have installed some of the standoffs, uh, or glorified washers, if you will, upside down. So on the white one, you can see that all of them have the sort of washer side down against the frame. So that's two out of two here, and then four out of four that are installed that way. And if we go over to our other case, okay. Uh, so on this one, you can see that the washers are installed a little more haphazardly, where we've got them at uh, different orientations for each of the washers. So half of them are on one way, half are on the other way. Mechanically, in terms of how they actually work and perform, uh, it didn't really affect anything. It all works the same way. It's just another really small QC or attention to detail issue where they've changed it between the two cases and between the eight screws. So none of those three things are major issues. It's just really small attention to detail. That's the kind of stuff we look for, and it does lend itself to a judgment when we get to the conclusion on how much attention a manufacturer is paying to the product overall. It gives us an idea for their QC processes as well. As far as removing the front panel, there's several reasons for it. One of them is swapping the fans or removing the lower side panels or just access in general. Now the fans, again, are seated further back in their stock position, and this not only helps the airflow like we talked about earlier, or at least in theory should when we'll see in testing, but it also provides a more diffuse lighting look to get a wider spread of that light and make it look less concentrated on singular LEDs. Lee and Lee has also taken steps to protect the magnets in the case from chipping, which was a problem we saw in the original Landcool 2 and complained about. In the Landcool 3, all magnets are inset and fixed with screws so that none of them can contact the surfaces they ultimately stick to. After removing a couple, we have a newfound respect for the process that was required to thread these tiny metal screws through the magnets. The lower side panels are fully ventilated with mesh to provide that airflow path to the fan mounts on top of the power supply shroud. This can benefit the GPU as well, although we'll look at that. And the case ships with one of the panels, again, sealed off with that removable plate, and it fits three two and a half inch drives. Okay, so enough of my section for now. We're gonna throw it over to Patrick to talk about some of the LEDs and other features on the case, and then will come back to me for thermals and acoustic analysis. Let's start with the front I.O. These are the RGB control buttons here. We've got the standard color and mode buttons. If I hit mode, it cycles through some of the built-in lighting modes. If I hit color, it cycles through seven baked in colors. This is a combined audio jack. We would generally prefer to have separate jacks for headphones and microphone. It's a little more flexible, but if you have a uh, four pole headset, this will work in this port and you know, normal headsets and mics will work in there as well. Two USB type A ports, these are color matched to the rest of the case and a USB type C port. So if we pop open the side of the case here, There are a total of three five volt, three pin ARGB headers that can be used to hook up additional items. This is obviously the RGB version of the case. The non RGB version doesn't have the control buttons on the front because it doesn't have an RGB controller. It doesn't have these extra headers here. It does, however, have a plate that mounts right here. Uh, that you could put your own third-party RGB controller on, which is a nice touch. Uh, I kind of wish they included it with this case as well, but you already have a baked-in controller. There's really good attention to detail throughout this case. Uh, for example, uh, Leon Lee here though has put some extra effort in and put these metal tabs on the side. And what that does is when you install these slot covers, normally if you installed one of these uh, without something below it, and then you tried to torque down a screw on top, the slot would rotate with the screw. All of the fans, uh, RGB and non-RGB, have the Leon Lee logo molded into the back. Most of the case is steel and glass and plastic, but these front handles right here are aluminum. 
Uh, you can't really tell in the white case, which is kind of a shame. I think it's maybe hard to anodize in this color, but on the black case, it's brushed anodized black aluminum. Some of the features that you might not think about, like the, uh, the screws for the PCIe slots, um, those are silver. The USB ports, those are white. All of the magnets and screws holding the magnets are silver here. In the black case, they're painted black. Uh, the rivets are silver here, black in the other case. All of the um, fittings here, these rubber grommets are gray here, they're black in the black case. So you can see in the accessory kit, it's kind of ridiculous. Everything is color matched except for the uh, hard drive cage screws. So unfortunately, all of the cool add-ons and tricks and gimmicks that Leon Lee has packed in here, as well as the steel construction and these thick aluminum rails and these glass panels make this a very heavy case. Empty um, with the accessory kit and it straight out of the box, it is almost 15 kilograms, 14.9, uh, which is just over 30 pounds. Um, we have not actually weighed it with the system inside yet, but it's heavy enough so that when I pick it up, I can actually feel a little bit of flex in the feet of the case. Now, the bottom of the case isn't unusually flexible, but the case itself is so heavy that if you lean it on its edge or move it sideways a little bit, you get this disconcerting feeling that the bottom of the case is moving. All right, so that was about 15 kilograms empty and full. Twenty point two five kilograms. So, building a system in this case, you're going to want to build it near where it's going to stay because I would not want to carry this up the stairs. All right, that'll do it for my section. Uh, I'll throw it back to Steve to cover the thermal and noise performance of the case. On to thermals and noise. Our testing focused on the Landcool Three RGB, which is theoretically not the highest performance SKU due to slightly lower maximum RPM of the three front fans versus the non-RGB model. We ran our standard test suite, but added an extra torture test using the non-RGB fans to see if they make a difference. Baseline for the CPU torture test with all stock fans was 42 degrees Celsius above ambient, and although swapping in the non-RGB fans resulted in a rounded 43 degree average, the actual difference is well within margin of error. All variants of the Landquil 3 are equipped with four 140mm fans, and with that kind of brute force cooling, the difference between 1600 RPM with the ARGB fans and 1800 RPM for the unit fans is negligible, at least for the CPU. Removing the front panel had no discernible effect on CPU temperature. The resistance offered by the mesh front panel is again offset by the brute force of the airflow. Compared to the Mesh 2 at 44.6 degrees, the Lanquil 3 is a few degrees better outside of error, and similarly, it improves about 3 degrees over the 215. All of these are a big upgrade over the Lanquil 1 and the pre-Mesh Lanquil 2. The Mesh Lanquil 2 happened as a result of our review, and the results are closer to the new 3. The Lanquil 3 beats everything on this comparative chart except for the Fractal Torrent which includes the Lanquil 2 Mesh's already above average 45 degree result. Corsair's 5000D airflow is priced similarly, about $150, and it runs at 48 degrees over ambient, allowing Lian Li a meaningful lead. The Cooler Master Half 500 also runs a few degrees behind, as does the once chart-topping P400A. Lian Li is well positioned here. In the same torture test, the GPU averaged 53 degrees Celsius above ambient, which was also unaffected by swapping in the non-RGB fans. Removing the front panel did lower temperatures down to 51 degrees, but that's a minor difference, especially considering that the CPU was unaffected. The Lanquil 2 mesh ran at 49 degrees, posting better results than the Lanquil 3 with our test configuration and the case layout. The 215 was similar to the Lanquil 3, but technically better. Comparatively, the Lanquil 3's GPU cooling isn't bad, but it definitely doesn't match up to its CPU cooling. The HAF 500 ran at 54 degrees, so about the same as the Lanquil 3, with similarly priced 5000D cases performing uh, lower compared to the Lanquil. The Torrent, the TD500, and the P500A all outperform the new competition. Average GPU temperature and fire strike testing rounds to 54 degrees Celsius above ambient, but the difference from the original torture test result is within margin of error. 
The removal of the CPU as the heat source didn't improve GPU temperatures, indicating that the strong front-to-back airflow is able to keep pace with hot air exhausted by the components. The Lankool 2 showed improved GPU thermals in this test with a 47 degree average, putting it further in the lead with the P500A leading. Much of the Lankool 3's performance so far can be explained by its four stock fans, so we can use this standardized fan test to see how the chassis itself stacks up against other Lankools. The Lankool 3, purely as a chassis, ends up at 43 degrees and right alongside the 215 and the Lankool 2 mesh. This shows that the fan count and type or placement are affecting the performance between these more than the case design itself. The Torrent Compact remains a chart leader for standard results, but Lian Li is right near the top and not far from its closest competitor. And of course, you'd use something like the normal Torrent with its included fans. With all four cases set to max speed in the RGB case variant, we measured a noise level of 48.7 dBA, putting it alongside Fractal's Torrent SKU as one of the loudest cases we've tested reducing the noise level to our 36 dBA threshold, required setting fan speeds to about 38% in BIOS, and we control the CPU and GPU for this. This is a more extreme reduction than usual, with a resulting logged RPM of approximately 1,000 for each fan. These fans can run fast and loud. It's worth building a custom fan curve with lower speed settings when you're below critical temperatures. The performance difference between the maximum 16 to 1800 speed and those used in our normalized testing at 1,000 is barely anything. Average CPU temperature climbed from 42 to 45 degrees Celsius above ambient, and average GPU temperature climbed from 53 to 54. It's absolutely worth the reduction in noise for this, and it proves that the Lankool 3 can perform well, even without forcing air through at max speed. The Lankool 3 shines in comparison to other cases on the noise normalized chart, although the GPU temperature still isn't as impressive as the CPU. So wrapping up then, first of all, on the nice side, on the positive side, Lian Li has actually done a very good job by including all kinds of mechanically complex elements. You got the doors, the lower doors. They really like doors on this case. There's, let's see, there's, there's the outside door, there's two inside doors, and there's a bottom door. So we're up to four doors for one side. I couldn't make, I couldn't use any more rhyming words. Uh, same thing on this side for the most part, other than the two cable covered doors. This is mechanically interesting as well, where it's got its own spring-loaded mechanism in here that uh, pushes in to actuate this spring on the inside. So there's a lot going on, and Lian Li gets credit from us for executing all of that in a way where nothing has failed. So that's good to see. There were a couple fit and finish problems we talked about. Removal of the front panel is not impressive. It's not different from what we normally see. And that's sort of the problem with this one, but not really a big deal. Uh, thermally, it did great. Acoustics were about what we would expect for this case. And uh, that leaves us with things like pricing and competition. So, uh, and concerns, I guess. We'll start with concerns. Our main concern with this is really just in some of the mechanisms where it's the wrong case. There's multiple angles where with the front panels not on it. Okay, let's try this again. The main thing we're concerned about is with the door opening mechanism where right now it works really well, but all of this, all the stuff we're talking about, even though it's really cool and it works well today, we're worried about how these all require a, a pretty tight tolerance for everything to work smoothly. And with multiple uh, either years of use or lots of usage cycles, so you only go through so many for a review, to be fair, you only open it so many times when you own it too, but with enough cycles, we are a little concerned about something breaking or with the alignment of the panels being just off enough that it no longer meets those tight requirements and you might get just a, a less than desirable experience with it. So that's one of our concerns long term. Today it all works great though. And the way this works is really simple where you just have a, a, this uh, component that punches a lever in there that breaks the magnetic bond for the panel. It's pretty simple. So even though we don't know how magnets work still today, we have people researching this right now, by the way. They've been working on it for years. Let's just say with the magnet research, I wouldn't title my video, am I wasting my money? I would title my video, I am wasting my money. So we're all on the same page with the, with the magnet research. So anyway, that's the downsides to think about. Competition. Uh, other cases in the same price class, historically at least, Fantex P500A, it's a great performer, but it's dated and it feels it. 
the P400A especially, P500, P400A are similar in, in many ways, but uh, the P500A is the newer and more expensive of the two, and um, we think that compared to this, it feels dated. Uh, another one would be the Corsair 5000D, or the 4000D on the much cheaper side, and those are good cases. The 5000D is a great competitor to this one. It is much simpler in how it physically works, and it does well thermally for the 5000D airflow, but the Lanquil 3 outperforms it in most of our testing, so even there, this has an advantage. Uh, other options, something like the Cooler Master H500, the new version of the, the Half 500, whatever it was called, that came out recently following the much cheaper previous one, would technically be a competitor, but we couldn't really recommend it at its price point when it launched, and we certainly don't, again, something that costs similarly and is much more interesting and better. You can always go cheaper, too, and check out something like the Fractal Pop Air, which we actually liked a lot, and it was in the $90 to $100 range, the Fractal Torrent on the other end, closer to $200, $190-$200 is a, uh, personally, uh, subjectively, I think a step up in overall quality um, and feel. It drops all of the sort of mechanical gimmicks and elements, however you want to look at them, and just focuses on one thing, which is lots of air volume, and it works well. Uh, the, the Torrent Compact is in there as well. So those are your options to look at for competition. We think this case, Overall, does well thermally, and uh, we have a few concerns for longevity of some of the stuff in here. That's normally the trade-off for things that are different and unique and bordering on gimmicks, but it does work well right now today. Uh, last bit I want to throw in. So this is one of the few cases where Patrick and I didn't fully agree on our uh, viewpoint on it throughout the process until the end, where when I saw it from the beginning, I was like, that's a pretty nice case. It looks good. I hadn't tested it or worked with it yet, but it was on the bench. And um, I thought it looked pretty good. He was like, uh, I'm not so hot on this case. And as he continued working on it, that turned into, I don't like this case. And then we got to the end, and he said, it's starting to grow on me. And here's where things changed. When we review cases and most products, we try to isolate ourselves from the price of the product until the last moment when we're making judgments on value. Because that helps us remove bias from the testing and the writing process about things like the features and uh, the, th the thermal or acoustic performance, so we can look at those in a vacuum. Then we add the price back in. It's like uh, you're, you're baking a cake and you need to sprinkle in a pinch of price. I don't know. Anyway, that's what we do without the cake part. It should be cake. But uh, <laughs> when we got to the end of it, Patrick had worked on this thing the whole time where we were both estimating this to be in the $250 price class, thinking that that would be very high but appropriate for something with this many things strapped to it to say, look shiny. And at 150 to 170 it seems actually pretty good. It's competitive. So I would then take all that and put us as relatively positive-ish. Uh, the, the ish or asterisk is um, that we've still got some concerns long term for it, but they did pretty well overall. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, subscribe for more. You can go to store.gamersaccess.net to grab this limited edition shirt. Once we make the full first run, we will not be making another one. So if you want to get one, go to the store and pick it up. It supports our testing and our in-depth reviews like this one today. Subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.